Podcasters, assemble! Hey, this is Matt in Buffalo from Upper Pylon 2, a Star Trek Deep Space Nine podcast. Hello there. This is Z from the Fluent Nerd podcast. This is Troidal Power from the Power Playthroughs podcast. G'day, the name's Ryan. I am a co-host of the podcast Scripture Read Badly. Hello, I am the Robo Gonzalez 9001. It's me, Daniel Kay, the host of the Daniel Kay's Let's Plays podcast project. Hi everybody, Gabe here from the Every Marvel Movie Ever podcast. This is Kate from the Blob of the Hut podcast. Hi, this is Justin from the Totally Super podcast, where we review every superhero movie ever made, and also the Trek Off podcast, your not safe for work comedy slash sometimes philosophy podcast. Hi, my name's Bill, and I'm from the RPG Golden Years podcast. Hi, my name's Jason Carpenter. I'm the host of Dead Rabbit Radio, the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. Hi, this is Arjuna Gonzalez. When I'm not working on Peace Island, I have some thoughts on Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Turmoil has engulfed the Galactic Republic. The taxation of trade routes to outlying star systems is in dispute. Hoping to resolve the matter with the blockade of deadly battleships, the Greedy Trade Federation has stopped all shipping to the small planet of Naboo. While the Congress of the Republic endlessly debates this alarming chain of events, the Supreme Chancellor has secretly dispatched two Jedi Knights, the Guardians of Peace and Justice in the Galaxy, to settle the conflict. So, some context here. This movie was released on May 19th, 1991. And I was 15 at its release. So pretty much, I dare say, the prime audience member at this time. I was super excited for The Phantom Menace when it was coming up. I was way into looking at all the media and everything. I was just a kid at the time, but I grew up watching the Star Wars movies with my older brother, who's seven years older than me. And when Phantom Menace came out, he and I actually went to see the movie together. I love the Star Wars prequels. At the time when this movie came out, I was five and a half years old, which I think is the perfect age to see that movie for the first time. I remember the lead up being just gigantic. The posters that you would see, the young Anakin Skywalker casting a shadow of Darth Vader against his hut on Tatooine. Amazing all-time great poster, so evocative. The press going up to release of this movie. I remember my dad saving a copy of a news magazine. I think... U.S. News and World Report, maybe, had a special article on the computers going into designing or making all the special effects for this. Now, I'm 43 years old. I was more than an adult. I was in my mid-20s, I think early 20s, when Phantom Menace came out. Now, we didn't have YouTube. We had internet existed, but it wasn't something that People didn't have access to high-speed internet. If you wanted to use high-speed internet, you had to be at your school. So this was a time when it was announced on the news when they were going to show the trailer, the very first trailer for The Phantom Menace. So forget the nerd sphere. Forget all of these articles we have today. It was on the nightly news. They said, I think it was on Tuesday night at 10.15, they were going to show the first trailer for the Phantom Menace. I remember I was out on a date and I told her we have to be home by like 10. Okay? I got to see this trailer and she was into it too. It was the first new Star Wars movie in in what? Like 15 20 years. Also in defense of the Gungans, I'm not the biggest fan, but the CGI made by Lucas Films was freaking outstanding. And I remember very clearly seeing one of the first pictures of the battle droids out on that big grass field and it blowing my mind at that time that that's all computer animated imagery and just oh man can you imagine what this is going to be like and i remember racing home and we got i mean i remember because of course you know you hit traffic lights and you don't leave exactly when you want 
I remember I have a vivid memory of me and her walking into the apartment and going straight to the television set and turning it on with only maybe a minute to spare. And then that first trailer comes up and that first image of the Gungans walking on their beast through the fog. And and it was just, I remember like that was, it was back. Star Wars was back. This is the first new image we see from this universe in a long time. Now, of course, people have mixed feelings about the Gungans, but man, what 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 a great trailer. What a great way to start the hype machine that really fed into the prequels and the prequel energy. The first time I saw Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, was on opening night in 1999. I forget the actual day, but it was in May, and I was with my younger cousin. We were in a small town in North Dakota, and I believe it was the 7 p.m. showing, which was the first showing. They didn't do, like, midnight showings, I guess, back then in a tiny rural town like that, but... His mom actually went and got tickets for us while we were at school, so we didn't have to, like, skip school and wait in line. But, yeah, after we finished school, we went and we hung out. We stayed in line for a while, and then we saw the incredibleness that was Star Wars Episode One. At least to us, it was incredible. For me, personally, this film has a huge, huge influence on me when it comes to the Star Wars series because this was the first film that I got to see, Star Wars wise, at the cinema. There I was, in the cinema, on the big screen, -na, 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 you know, all the music, all the lights, you get the show, we we'll roll up the page, and wow, like, what a spectacle. You know, no matter what your opinion is on this film, or how you feel about Jar Jar Binks and all the other sort of little nuances that people think about it. Wow, this blew me away. Like my first experience of a Star Wars film on the big screen. Yeah, it was epic. It made me realize, wow, this is how these films are meant to be watched. And I think it was the first time that I had that kind of cinematic experience where it wasn't about watching the movie, it was about watching the spectacle of the movie. So when he finally gets a chance to make a new Star Wars, uh, he gets to Star Wars Episode One, and a lot of people would complain that Episode One is this, is George Lucas's opportunity to show off his technical prowess to go, hey, look what we can do now with just actors and green screens. Isn't this neat? Look what we can show. And while you can say that in large part this movie is a success as far as that's concerned. Um, I think that there is real legitimate criticism to be lobbied about the story itself. Specifically, um, and I realized this only when I took my son to go see, who was I think like five at the time, to go see the re-release of episode one in 3D when they did that. I wish they had done this with all the other three. For me, I remember sitting in the movie theater and I had read the novelization, so I knew what the plot was going to be going in. I read the novelization probably a week before the movie came out. I knew the story itself was a little shaky. So I, there was a nice way to approach it. I was like, oh, there's gonna be some, not the tightest story in the world. My first experience with The Phantom Menace, I had seen the original trilogy first. My dad showed them to me in release date order. I was a big fan of those. I had like, I had all the character encyclopedias and a bunch of the Lego sets. I played those Lego games constantly. Cause the first Lego Star Wars game, it's all about the prequels. I probably played that more than I, actually watched the movies more than I actually watched the prequels anyway but I remember it was because we used to get DVDs from Netflix because not a lot of people remember that I think you can still do it but Netflix before it was this huge streaming thing they would send DVDs in the mail and I remember we got that and I just remember my dad being really indifferent about it he was kind of like oh yeah okay we'll we'll rent that one but he clearly wasn't a big fan I don't remember if he told me that he didn't like it I just remember there wasn't a lot of love coming from him like there was when we watched those original three. I don't really, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed to admit, I don't really specifically remember going to see the movie with him. I remember all the excitement about it coming up to it and the excitement coming out because let me tell you, when I was a kid, I loved this movie. It was a lot of fun. 
Um, what I do love about uh, the story of me and my brother seeing this though is I actually still have the tickets. I have a little case that they sit in um, and I've got a poster I need to get framed and put up. Uh, but yeah, I still have the tickets from when my brother took me to see The Phantom Menace way back when it first came out. I remember very clearly going into the movie theater at 15 with my cousin. We went to the worst theater in town because they had the biggest seating capacity. Uh, the sound stunk. The screen was tiny. I swear the floor of the theater slightly tilted backwards. The seats were garbage. But my God, going to see a new Star Wars movie was just Oh, can you believe that this was finally starting to happen? It felt like I was waiting my whole lifetime for it, which at 15, I guess I more or less was. It was quite the experience. We had never seen the movie theater packed like it was. There were people dressed up. There was just so much love for Star Wars there. And I think we were young enough where, you know, we weren't, we didn't catch a lot of that disappointment as some older people seem to have. But yeah, it's definitely a night I'll always remember, and it really helped to cement my love of Star Wars, since it was the first time I got to see a movie on opening night. As I'll probably talk about in later episodes, I am a special edition era fan. So I saw the OT on the big screen, but it wasn't opening night, it was with the re-releases. So the film opens up <laughs> after the show reel telling you, hey, you know, there's some Jedi's doing some stuff. <laughs> They've gone to see some people. Um, <clears throat> and we open up and here we are with the guy from Taken, Liam Nielsen, <laughs> and our good old Obi-Wan Kenobi, played by the other guy. <laughs> Ewan McGregor, sorry. <laughs> My brain just went dead for a second then. And yes, there was a lot of hype around Ewan McGregor being cast as Obi-Wan Kenobi. And I think for the most part, he does a very good job. And I just love the way they sort of like, the film's just no nonsense. Like, here we go. These two Jedis turn around, take the hoods off. Oh, it's Liam Neeson. <laughs> and Ewan McGregor. So I was sitting there. The opening music fanfare hits, chills down my spine. And you go into this first sequence of the movie where you see the Jedi at the peak of their power. And there's a revelation that, hold on, wait, that ratty robe thing wasn't just what the crazy old hermit wore. This was their uniform. So that was a little crazy and shocking. I'm like, oh, they're all hermit monk kind of like warriors. It's just kind of like, ooh, this is what they are. Okay, this is new information. Feed it to me, feed it to me. And then you see them ignite their lightsabers and it's just all oh my god this is finally it they're gonna do some stuff right away in this movie we get one of my uh favorite uh, uh jedi scenes because the movie starts with uh obi-wan kenobi and qui-gon jinn being sent to negotiate with the trade federation which you know the the the, the intergalactic politics stuff isn't my favorite thing one of the arguments that people have against the phantom menace is that it's concerned with trade routes and taxation and all this boring stuff but early on in the movie qui-gon jinn says something that quickly dispels the notion that this movie is just going to be concerned with that boring logistical stuff he says i sense an unusual amount of fear for something as trivial as this trade dispute now that is showing that straight away this is just a cover for something ominous something that is happening deeper than anybody realizes also these movies are extremely quotable and their meme potential is outstanding if you haven't been to our prequel memes you owe it to yourself to go check it out you'll probably get sucked in like everyone else does uh the negotiations go south right away which is a great line where i say you know you were right about one thing master the negotiations were short but then we get some sweet Jedi stuff where the Jedi are just hacking away at these battle droids. They like deflecting lasers all over the place. They are fighting in a way that Jedi didn't fight in the original Star Wars trilogy. We're seeing a much more fluid style of action here. And I think that's really cool. And you start seeing this crazy action of like, oh, wait, they can deflect all those bolts at the same time. They can dart off at an incredible speed. They can do some crazy jumping. They can take their lightsaber and melt a solid door with it oh that was incredible that was one of the 
first things that you get into this experience of seeing a new Star Wars. It's the Jedi at their full potential. And this is like, wait, this is what Luke just kind of was playing at doing? My favorite light side moment that's got to be, and this is a really silly, minuscule thing. It's not like, oh, it's this huge, rousing speech and the John Williams score picks up and it's the most wonderful thing in the world. It's just that weird dash that Obi-Wan does. It's hilarious. And yeah, he probably should have used it so Qui-Gon Jinn didn't get stabbed later on. But uh, that's a little moment. It's so weird, but it's one of those Jedi powers that's kind of like, yeah, these guys are they're pretty badass. So it had this great effect of like looking forward to like, wow, this is what Luke was developing into. And had he had time, he could take over anything because he was fighting old men who could barely move at that point. It had such a neat effect of just sitting there looking at the movies down the line, even in that moment of just, wow, this is something totally new and exciting. It Even then you would look at back at what you had experienced before and it really recontextualized a lot of the original series and we see other people being terrified of going up against the jedi because they're like close the blast doors and he's like that won't be enough i i love the that i don't love those characters but i love the the guy who's just like ah oh, man we're so screwed the, have you ever gone up against a jedi before he's he's good i like him not necessarily the rest of his compatriots And straight away in this film, we're treated to a lot of lightsaber action (laughs) Uh, as they start to fight off all the droids and stuff inside uh, inside the circle. And we're treated to points with the Sith Lord and loads of bits and bobs and gadgets. And then our guys get transported down to the planet. And then we meet Jar Jar Binks. (laughs) Uh, Now, like I said, I think the first time I saw this, I didn't have time to process what Jar Jar Binks really was. And I found it really confusing and quite difficult to understand him. But, you know, it could have been worse. (laughs) Uh, Let's hope he doesn't go on to become like a galaxy leader or anything. eh? I think Star Wars is probably the most quotable franchise of all time. And one quote I've used from Phantom Menace a lot, which maybe this makes me sound like a real uh, real stuck-up guy or whatever, but I, I love when Qui-Gon is talking to Jar Jar and he says, The ability to speak does not make you intelligent. That's some solid, that's a solid diss. And if you're ever in a weird fight with somebody, weird verbal argument, just use that. It's great. I think that's what Will Hunting should have used in that bar instead of whatever he actually ended up saying. And yes, there's Jar Jar Binks, but I think Jar Jar is just as important in The Phantom Menace as Wicket is in Return of the Jedi, but I also think he's in the movie maybe a little bit too much, or there is too much emphasis on his gags that don't necessarily have payoff for anybody over the age of three. But when I saw the movie when I was five, I thought he was great. And I probably thought he was great up until I was maybe 15. So honestly... There is some childhood appeal to Jar Jar Binks, but for the most part, he is this fount of levity, sometimes when you don't necessarily want it, in a movie that is very heavily concerned with politics and intrigue. And I realized that Jar Jar Binks was not the problem with the movie, that the problem with the movie centered around the pacing. And actually, I was super, super, super thankful to Jar Jar Binks for existing because um, sitting there with like a kid, with a younger kid, um, the pacing of the movie was super problematic. Uh, you had taxes and council meetings and Senate meetings. A lot of it was like C-SPAN for Star Wars. And and he, I would see him drift. I would see him sort of fade. Um, but when Jar Jar popped up, it was he. Now, the underwater scene when they swim down. Um, and they put in, they've got the little things they pull out their pockets, they put them in their mouths and boom, you know, underwater breathing apparatus. I love, I love the way Star Wars does this sort of thing where it looks like they're in such a primitive environment and everything seems so organic and yet they always seem to have like a really cool piece of like really advanced technology and I believe it's part of the charm of the universe and this is just one of those little things you know just put it out put it in your mouth boom, I can breathe underwater you know rather than you know like we have nowadays huge scuba diving gear you put on your back but I love that scene where they just dive down into the water with Jar Jar and they go over the ridge underneath the water, and there it is. There's a huge underwater 
thriving city down there. And then, I don't know why, <laughs> it's kind of all like a, under a bubble, isn't it? So they all, they're in like an air bubble underneath, like one that's built up on the surface. <laughs> and then we meet the uh, the rather large leader of the Jar Jar clan. <laughs> yeah, I just I just love that scene. Uh, I love again, like I say, the kind of the strange, like futuresque technology where there's a huge bubble of wall, like a huge bubble that's protecting these people from the crushing pressure of the water outside. And you just walk through it; it just wobbles a little bit. <laughs> it's just like the amount of technology that must go into that, but it just looks so organic and natural with the environment around it. The scene where Qui Gon Jinn, Obi Wan, Jar Jar are in the submersible vehicle, and they're going through the tunnel. They have to go through the center of the planet, and you see the series of sea monsters chasing them. Very, very small, very, very underrated scene. And it's really something that Lucas did in all of his Star Wars movies. I think Revenge of the Sith is the only one he didn't do this in. Lucas gave us kids a monster. Whether it was the garbage monster in the first Star Wars, we had the, uh, what was the name, the Wampa? In Empire Strikes Back, we had the Rancor in Return of the Jedi. And now, after 20 years, we're having this series of increasingly larger giant fish monsters coming out of the darkness trying to attack the sub that scene is almost forgotten when we talk about star wars but that really was a moment where as i'm watching it i have a smile on my face and i was like i could imagine breaking out my action figures and being in the bathtub or being at a muddy creek and having them swim around underwater and have a giant fish oh no we got to get away we got to get away from this monster Lucas really liked doing the monster thing in his movies. And this was just a reminder of how dangerous the Star Wars universe actually is. There's a lot less greebling in this movie as opposed to the original trilogy. There's like a couple of articles about how industrial light and magic kind of pioneered this aesthetic of a used future where there's all sorts of little bits and kit bash i think is the industry term like poking off of everything and that serves several functions for example if you've got like a star destroyer or a death star uh it helps kind of communicate the sense of scale like the idea that there's all sorts of futuristic bits and stuff hanging off of it uh whereas a lot of surfaces even on the inside of the spaceships like um in the cockpit in the the ship that lands on Tatooine, I can't remember the name. There's a lot less, it feels a lot less detailed. Like, there's just a lot of blank panels and featureless surfaces. Except for, like, cases where they had to carry over the original designs from the 70s and 80s movies. Like, you know, R2-D2 obviously has to look the same in Episode 1 as he did in 4 through 6. But it's interesting to see that contrast. And I guess maybe... If the original trilogy was supposed to give the idea of a used future, it makes sense then that the prequels would have a sense of a not yet used future. But this is the one that definitely has the most practical effects, and there's really something to be said for that. The stuff on Tatooine especially is what I think of when I'm like, what are the best things about The Phantom Menace? You have a lot of practical stuff going on, because you have CGI there with Sebulba and with the Padres, but... There's a real environment there, which you can't really say about many of the locations in those three movies, so I think that's definitely one of the best aspects of that one. My favorite music cue is probably just the transition between after Qui-Gon Jinn has his little dialogue with Obi-Wan about Anakin's midichlorian count, and just as it transitions to the scene of Darth Maul and his spacecraft landing on Tatooine. The way the music transitions from just something appropriate for, like, the scene on the little balcony they have there to the really sinister... I don't even know what instrument they're playing is, but just the way it transitions between the two of them just came across, like, excellent. Just very well done. Honorable mention is going to be Anakin's theme because John Williams just so masterfully weaves in the um, Darth Vader, as we call it, the Darth Vader theme. Dun, 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 dun. But it's like so soft and subtle, you barely even notice it. You know, 
this there was a scene that was in the novelization that I think not being in The Phantom Menace actually hurt the entire franchise. And it was a very, very small scene at the time. When you're reading the book, before the pod race scene, Anakin is riding, I think it was a swoop. He was riding some sort of vehicle out in Tatooine, and it breaks down, and he has no way to get back, and he is actually found by a family of Tusken Raiders, of Sand People, and he spends the night with them, and they care for him. And they help him repair his vehicle. And then the next day he goes back to his mom. And then during the pod race scene, there's a quick shot of it in the movie. This part is still in the movie. In the pod race scene, the sand people are actually trying to shoot the other pod racers down to help him win. Now, they, I think they take a shot at him in the final cut of the movie. I, I don't remember that exactly. But could you imagine the impact of the scene of Attack of the Clones when he massacres the Sand People. If we knew that it was a mere, what, 10, 12 years earlier that they saved him from dehydration, from getting lost in the desert, and so on and so forth. I think that having that element out of the, this, the trilogy actually kind of hurt the trilogy. thought it was a great moment in the book. There's still a little taste of it in the movie, but I really would have loved to see that scene of young Anakin being saved by the Sand People. We're also introduced to pod racing, which even though the sequence in the movie is a little bit too long, it's pretty sweet. Maybe it shouldn't have been in the movie as big as it is, dominating such a long stretch of the movie, and that's the pod race. The pod race, which I think is lost on people, um, when you watch it on a small screen, people have been watching it on other TVs, even the flat screen TVs, you have to understand, if you know somebody with a home theater or with a projector, you get a chance to see it on the big screen, you realize the pod race, I, I found myself ducking and go, oh, and they, like, it was something that was designed to be cinematic and put you in the center of it. I'll bet it would be amazing in virtual reality, frankly. The pod racing scene in episode one is pretty cool in isolation. Watching the movie again, I was kind of like a little bit wondering like why are we spending time on this why are we here watching this pod race happen a long time gets spent on it and it's not really that connected with everything that else is going on and the part that i really loved about it at least for the beginning part of it is that there is no music it really is just that amazing sound design of all the distinctive sounds i can hear them in my head right now the sounds of all the different pod racers the only argument is it really is a big chunk of the movie that is unmistakably something that just could be super cut down or maybe doesn't need to be there at all if you're being really critical of it, but I'm not going to be. So I think the Phantom Menace is exploring a little bit of the Grey Jedi concept, which is Qui-Gon Jinn. I mean, here you have a Jedi who's not afraid to buy someone, and he's not afraid to cheat in order to buy someone. So that's a little bit different. If you cut this out from the movie completely and just watched it as something to demo your awesome sound system or your TV, it's pretty crazy entertaining. Like I said, the sound design's pretty thrilling. The action is pretty awesome frankly is pretty cool for being just a completely well almost completely cgi extravaganza really fairly memorable characters throughout it believe it or not that you know they have no real impact on anything other than just being mario kart villains from outer space really um yeah i'm gonna talk about my favorite part of the movie my favorite few seconds of the movie right now i'm here to talk to you about rats tyrell Rats Tyrell. Now, I never really remember this guy's name. All I remember about him is his brief, like, three seconds uh, of, of scream before exploding in the pod race. Uh, Rats Tyrell, I've just done some, some research on him uh, on the Wikipedia. Uh, so I thought I'd start with just, like, uh, just just introducing to him you to him as a character and, and then describing why I like his his death cameo so much. 
I mean, it feels awkward to like a death. That's no good, is it? Liking a death. That's that's no. If you if you if you like a death, make sure you really assess what's going on <laughs> with you liking that death. But I think I've assessed assessed what's going on here, and I'm still happy with with liking the death of Rats Tyrell. Uh, so Rats Tyrell, uh, reading off the Wikipedia here, who he was a male Alina pod racer. Alina is his race. Uh, now Alina's. Um, looking at Wikipedia here, they're like these short little uh, warm-blooded reptilians possessing of exceptional reflexes as well as fast metabolism which allows them to convert food into energy very rapidly in order to escape predators on their harsh home planet. And they're omnivorous and uh, Al Alina cuisine is culturally intensely spicy. Um, this is a fun fact about Alina's. Uh, it, it says they're warm-blooded reptilians, but um, this Rats Tyrell guy, f like, he always reminds me of, a, like, a Paleozoic amphibian. One of those weird, like, swampy, axolotl looking pre-dinosaur amphibians you see all the time, you know? Yeah, he looks like a weird, you know, 200 million year old amphibian to me. But yeah, he's just like a little kind of slimy looking amphibian reptile guy. He races pods. Um, Alina's, just reading off the Alina page a little bit more. They're social and they tend to thrive best in close-knit teams, if not with their own kind, apparently. And they develop strong loyalties to friends and protect. they protect those who care about they care about fiercely. And due to their inborn curiosity, the Alina were stereotypically galactic travellers, tourists in every sense. And this, combined with their strong dedication to their relatives, resulted in Alina families travelling to even the most unusual and dangerous locations just to see its sights. There you go. Now, back to Rats Tyrell. Alright. So, he's this guy, um, and he's in the pod race. He's got a pretty good reputation amongst the other racers as being, like, a very professional racer. He's very gentleman-like. He never cheats or anything. And he privately has this horrible, like, uh, grudge against, uh, you know, the bad guy, the Doug. What's his name? Zabulba! Zabulba! Yeah, so Rats Tyrell goes into this race, the Bunta Eve Classic, the pod race from the movie Star Wars Phantom Menace Episode 1, uh, and he's like, shit, I'm gonna get that guy Zabulba this time, I'm gonna real, really, uh, re I'm, I think I'm gonna kill him in a cave, maybe, right? Uh, and so Rats Tyrell, uh, on the Bunta Eve Classic, uh, he plans uh, to rid himself of Zabulba, but he works towards this goal alone. There are several other pod racers who are going to kill Sebulba, they think. But he's doing it on his own, not in like some scheming team. So he lines up his pod racer the first row of the starting grid alongside his fellow racers, like Aldar Bido and Mal Honik, and his target, Sebulba. And uh, Tyrell's wife is also in the audience. She'd recently given birth to another child named Dobby Tyrell. Uh, but she attended the race anyway, along with her three other younglings. So he's got four kids now. Tyrell did manage to complete one lap, though he had not yet been presented with an opportunity to take out Sebulba, who was far ahead. The Alina's race, however, was cut short on his second lap in the Laguna Cave, a tight cavern full of massive stalactites. Worried that young Anakin Skywalker would overtake him, Tyrell lost concentration as he passed through the cave. Meanwhile, his accelerator jammed, and he was unable to gain clearance past the rocky stalactites, and Tyrell's vehicle collided with a large rock and he died in the explosion that ensued. ensued. Even if he had survived the explosion, he had no chance of expecting help from anyone as the Laguna Cave was rumoured to contain a crate dragon. So that's his appearance in the movie, which stuck with me from childhood watching this, and it's what I—it's the first thing I think of when I, when I when I think of Star Wars Episode One. I'll go back and talk a little bit about why, but I just want to keep on reading the rest of this Wikipedia article because it's pretty interesting, I think. <clears throat> Tyrell's family was devastated after his death, though it only marked the beginning of their troubles to follow. Rats Tyrell's own brother sold his daughter, Dejula, as a slave to Sebulba. 
his nemesis. And then his son, Deland, under the nickname Pabs, intended to race Sebulba for his sister's freedom on the planet Eucaron. However, Sebulba was not the one racing. Rather, it was the Doug's son, Hecula. Can you believe it? And meanwhile, Sebulba sabotaged the young Alina, ruining his chances of winning. Right? That sucks. I think I read... Where are we? Um... Oh, there's a good, there's a good bit up here. His um, his son. Where is it? Rats Tyrell's son went on to found a. Here we are. His son went on to found the Rats Tyrell Foundation, which attempted to outlaw the sport of pod racing. So that's all the that's all the fun Rats Tyrell history I thought I'd share with you. Now back to what actually appears in the movie is just some the, the pod racing and Anakin Skywalker's going through the caves and then it quickly just shows like a tiny little it's such a fast cut. It's like because it's in the middle of the pod race, everything is happening at a million miles an hour and this Rats Tyrell guy just looks like this tiny, tiny little little amphibian lizard, and it's just a two-second cut of him looking over his shoulder. And he's obviously, I think he's, I think he's a real puppet that they made. I don't think he's maybe enhanced with a little bit of CGI in the mouth, but he, the way it moves, it looks like a real physical little amphibian lizard. It's so convincing. Tyrell looks over his shoulder for just like a fraction of a second, and then back in front of him, sees that he's gonna crash. And then you just see him throw his tiny arms up in the air. And they're so small, he can't even lift them straight up. They just kind of go up as far as he can manage. And it's so feeble and small. And he screams as loud as he can. But for Rat Cyrell, his loudest scream is him going, Eeeh! And then BANG! He just explodes in the biggest fireball you've ever seen. But that tiny little moment of him, like, the, like most pure fear of death panic that this tiny little being and all it can will up is to go Eeeh! and then it just explode and it's over so quickly stuck with me for so long so that's why I love Rats Tyrell and it made for a fantastic Nintendo 64 game I don't know if the younger generation knows how big a deal pod racing was when this movie came out like there was a whole like n64 tie-in game after episode one that was just about pod racing i didn't own it but a friend owned it and yeah we we played that a lot and it was incredibly cool but it's a cool scene and and it's got cool action in it and it inspired uh the most awesome racing game ever star wars episode one pod racer for the nintendo 64 so it's got to get some credit for that Again, it's a part that you make a video game of just by itself. It's fun. My favorite droid moment has got to be when C-3PO meets R2-D2. Because that is almost spoiled with that line where, what is it? Um, C-3PO says, I'm thinking, oh, my parts are hanging out. A dick joke, really? But... You know, knowing that this is like the beginning of an epic friendship between two droids that is going to last six movies. I, I assume six movies. I don't know if they're around in seven or eight. But that is just the high point of the movie for me. Although I will give an honorable mention to the part where R2-D2 uh, gets out and saves the ship early on. That was good. And it is also, I think, the very first movie that I cried during, at the point where Anakin ran away from his mum and was told to not look back. I was I was very emotional. It wasn't something that I necessarily wanted to picture myself as a kindergartner having to do, run away from home. But apart from that, I had a really great time during this movie. And I think because I was so young and grew up not only with the other prequel movies, but also the tie-in video games... I was able to maybe enjoy this movie and the prequels in general more than the older fans or the fans that considered themselves quote unquote more pure. This movie is chock full of 
awesome quotes, but I'm going to pick one that's from Obi-Wan Kenobi. It was great seeing him as a young lad and quite sassy one at that. So when they're on tattooing and they pick up Anakin, he says to Qui-Gon, Why do I sense we've picked up another pathetic life form? So we really get to see the sass of Obi-Wan, which is showcased nicely throughout the prequel trilogy. Another thing I really like in this movie is the establishment of uh, the different cities. I think that Naboo's really pretty. And then I think when you go underwater and you get to see the Gungan city, it's just like magical. The Gungans are uh, a, an interesting species. I think there could be some really cool stuff with them in the expanded universe. I've never really looked into it, but their city looks super cool. Those domes floating under the water and everything's glowing as the Jedi and, uh, and Jar Jar Beaks swim up to him, I think is a really, really cool setting. And it's, it's really neat to see. And then later on, when we get to Coruscant, Coruscant is beautiful as well. I, it's kind of a silly thing. Like this Star Wars does the thing where every planet is like a single thing. Like there is a swamp planet and a desert planet and a snow planet. And this is a city planet. The whole planet is just one big city. And I'm like, I have so many questions about how it got that way, but it looks so cool. And at this point, I am excited to see what could happen in the future on a planet that is all one big city. But the thing that I think is maybe my favorite thing out of all of the prequels is Coruscant. So the concept of a city that spans the entire surface of a planet wasn't originated by George Lucas. I think he was probably inspired by Trantor from the Foundation series by Isaac Asimov. I had a joke in my notes about uh, where I accidentally call Coruscant Trantor, which is a world in one of Isaac Asimov's novels where the, in the planet is one giant city. And this concept has existed in fiction for a while. Um, Dan Simmons has it in uh, the Hyperion Canto series. Uh, Norton has it in uh, one of his series. And it's just such a cool thing when you read it in the paper, in these books. And it's just such a crazy concept of, man, what would that be like? And of course you put it in this very human understanding of what we have here. You think of New York City just going to the horizon. But when they designed Coruscant for this, every level that you see it at, it's just mind-blowing. It's nothing I would have ever imagined having read these books. That's not what I was picturing. This is just how it looked from orbit, how it looked flying, and then when you eventually get down to the surface, how the depth of this... It's just amazing. And every bit of it, it just felt like such a unearthly kind of an environment, but still kind of like real, but fantastical at the same place at the same time. I found that environment just amazing. And I just wish that they could have a whole Star Wars set in that environment. And also, I bet you've gotten a few submissions that have mentioned this, but hopefully I can be the one to put it in the episode that the ETs are in the Senate. The aliens from ET. They probably have a technical name, do they? I don't know. I don't know if they do. But they're all in the Senate. That's one of my favorite Easter eggs. Because it's, you know, it's just Lucas and Spielberg have been friends forever. So it's fun that he's like, I'm coming back. I'll throw a little Steven reference in there. Always loved that. Always thought that was great. The Phantom Menace introduces us to the Jedi Order, which, as a religious person, I appreciate and am able to empathize in a way to this religious organization and how it is structured and their very particular moral code that they abide by. Uh, but of course, it's different to any religion that we have here on Earth. Uh, so that's a little bit different too. And that requires some exploration if you want to understand it fully. The light side moment that stands out most to me is that first meeting with the Jedi Council that Qui-Gon Jinn has on Coruscant, uh, where he's explaining about how Anakin is the chosen one and his midichlorian count, I know, is off the charts, and 
uh, mostly because of like the importance of that scene uh, when this movie was new in theaters and we only knew what we did from the original trilogy because there's so much that gets unpacked and hinted at that we had no prior knowledge of in the older movies. Like, back when it was just episodes 4 through 6, we didn't know anything about the Jedi Council or any of all of this other backstory. My favorite dark side moment. It's the part when it's Darth Maul, he's talking to Palpatine, who's in all the trailers, I'm pretty confident. It's just the, at last we will reveal ourselves, at last we will have revenge. Really good way to be like, the Sith are this underlying threat. They're in the underbelly. You don't totally know what's going on with them, but they're mysterious. They're bad news, basically. And I think a guy who looks like the devil talking to an old man in a cloak that you recognize from Return of the Jedi, that's a pretty good way to be like, hey, here's the bad guys. Look at these guys. They're, they're bad news, and they're going to be bad news for our heroes later on. I really enjoyed the groundwork for... Palpatine, you really get to see how he played everyone and how he's really pulling the strings all the way back even from that far back in the trilogy and there's one instance in particular um, when he says about the Gungans he says, wipe them out all of them so I think that's a really effective way of just showcasing his pure evilness Darth Maul is probably the highlight to this movie for me. Um, when you first see him show up on Tatooine and fight Qui-Gon Jinn, it's a pretty cool fight scene, but it's over fairly quickly. Um, the real highlight for this movie is when you get to the end, uh, the queen and her people are trying to sneak into the throne room while the Gungans are attacking the droids outside. There's this part towards the end when Queen Amidala and all of the people she's with, they're trying to get to the throne room and... So they're on the outside of the building and all of a sudden they like break out these grappling hook gun things and they shoot it to the level ahead of them. And then they just like ascend up there. And that moment for me has always just resonated with me. Again, when we talk about these movies, we talk about them as play, playing, use, using our imagination, using our toys, playing with these, playing with our toys, reenacting this stuff. Yes, you can reenact the space shoot. Doo -doo 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 -doo. You can do all that. You can reenact the Darth Maul battle. But the scene where Princess Amidala and her team of like security experts, her security bodyguard crew, whatever you want to talk, her internal police, whatever the term is for those guys, when they're retaking the palace, that is something that you could easily reenact with your action figures. And we really hadn't seen that before. We have seen... The good guys and the bad guys shoot it out, but they've always been in fairly sterile environments. We've seen them fight on the Death Star. We've seen them fight in Hoth. We saw them fight in the forest of Endor. But here we had a beautiful city. We saw a hint of it, and they kept having those establishing shots of Naboo. We saw how beautiful and peaceful this city was, and now we have block by block fighting. And not only that, not only that, we have them using those little gadgets that we would pretend were on our action figures. Like when they shoot off the little grappling hooks and they go up onto the top of the building and they're like, yeah, go up, put a smile on my face. I go, I remember tying dental floss around Han Solo's hand on a little action figure and using a paper clip for a hook. One of my favorite moments in the film is you know, it's all the stuff towards the end. It's all the big battle scenes and all the movements and stuff. And there's the bit where there is the army of Jar Jar Binkses <laughs> uh, taking on the army of robots that are being sent down by the, uh, the imperialist fascists <laughs> or whoever they are. And there, yeah, I just love that scene where, again, the, 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 Jar, the Jar Jar's clan, all those people, they have very organic looking weaponry where they fire these huge big blue balls through the air and whatever electrical stuff it touches, it just ob obliterates it. And it's very, it's a, it's a very engaging scene. There's a lot going on and they do a really good job of making it very warlike. But unfortunately you've then got the thing of Jar Jar just running through, somehow comedically, comedically winning the day. 
Um, <laughs> he seems to fall over and trip over himself a lot and cause accidents, but the accidents end up taking out large proportions of the army <laughs> that they're fighting against. And yeah, it's very silly, but uh, I do I do enjoy it. The kind of the mixture of action and also comedy that's kind of mixed in there, which is a big staple in the Star Wars series. There is a lot of that that goes on later on, and in the original films too. There are absolutely some shots in this movie that still stand up today, but when it fails, it pretty obviously fails in a way that like makes sense in the time that it was filmed, like. A lot of shots from the Naboo world towards the end of the movie, like, they just look like the green field on the Windows XP desktop wallpaper. And Anakin has, through hijinks, ended up in a spaceship and going up into battle uh, in space. Um... Also, can we talk about how every single ship that Naboo has created is badass looking? I mean, every one of them looks like an old Corvette. I mean, all of them have beautiful lines, they're shiny, they're pretty and they perform well. So I think the best ships in the prequels were absolutely anything made by Naboo. Best vehicle? That Trade Federation donut? Yes, I know it's a, it's a, what is it, a Lucre Hulk class battleship or something? I don't know. The guys at Wikipedia can get back to you about that one. But it's a pretty rad design. It's not just another Death Star, so props for that. This movie has some incredible clean amazing designs i think my favorite ship is going to be the naboo starfighter those bright banana yellow starfighters they're just super visually cool and unlike any sci-fi ships that i had ever seen and just to see them all in a fleet like that too was pretty cool and then of course having little annie pilot one was the icing on the cake my favorite quote, it's got to be uh, when Anakin is flying out of the ship that he's just destroyed and yells, Now this is pod racing! Uh, because of that name that Troy posted when <laughs> he started this season. Now this is podcasting! I loved it. The second awesome set piece of the movie, and I'll work in a few positives here, is, of course, and I'm sure everybody's going to be talking about it. It might be the thing that is the most enduring from this movie is the whole events around the Duel of the Fates fight. First, you have this incredible villain. I think easily the best villain of the prequels, Darth Maul. And of course, there's Darth Maul. Darth Maul looks awesome. He fights incredibly. He is portrayed very well by Ray Park. And that final lightsaber duel is pretty amazing. Best music cue. Honestly, The Phantom Menace, say what you will about it. It may not be flawless. But something that is absolutely, undisputably perfect about this movie is Duel of the Fates. It's one of John Williams' best, and I think at this point most iconic Star Wars compositions. It's wonderful, and the second those doors open, and Darth Maul's standing there, and he fires up his double-bladed lightsaber, that is some iconic imagery. And that just, the choir, it just beats down on you the way that all three of those guys are beating down on each other. And it's really a spectacle. I love that moment. I think that's one of the best moments. Definitely in the prequel trilogy. I, I think that's wonderful. Now, the fight with the Sith Lord. My god. <laughs> this, this is brilliant. This is probably actually one of the better fights in the whole of Star Wars when we finally get Darth Maul and he reveals his double-ended lightsaber. And then Darth Maul comes in and he's got his hood up and the queen and everyone's like, oh man, and Qui-Gon's like, we got this, leave him to us. And they all go one way and Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan walk up as uh, Darth Maul takes off his hood and you hear that music start going. And then he's like, they're, they pull their lightsabers out and they're ready to fight him. And then he turns his lightsaber on and one side of the lightsaber ignites like, Chew! and you're like, whoa, that's cool. It's a red lightsaber. You know, we've seen it, whatever. And then the other side the nice Chew! and it's a two-sided lightsaber. And then the music goes, oh, 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 oh. that's that right there. Ah, oh, that makes this movie worthwhile for me. I know this isn't a lot of people's favorites, but Darth Maul and the ignition of the two lightsabers and then that music kicking on makes the whole movie worthwhile. So, of course, when you have John Williams 
pretty much it's an instant classic, right? Uh, this movie has so much good music. John Williams is such a genius. Um, it's hard to even just pick like a favorite. But I think I might go with The Duel of Fates just because it's so unlike anything we ever heard. It's got that beautiful choral arrangement and it's just got this intensity and it just melds with the lightsaber fight at the end so well and it really helps to signify uh, the importance of that battle that's taking place. John Williams does it again. Good on him. And that, of course, led to that whole lightsaber battle sequence. Yeah, it's a little bit overly theatrical in what they're doing, but the pacing of it, the moving through the different environments, something that you saw in, you know, uh, Empire, Jedi, other uh, lightsaber battles previously, but this is that on steroids. And then that action scene just continues to be awesome because you get this like flipping and jumping around with the Jedi and, and Darth Maul fighting each other. Again, doing some of these like crazy acrobatic moves where they're clearly using the force in conjunction with their, uh, their physical prowess as well. And it's just, it's so good. And it's the kind of movement like that you saw in Star Wars video games, but you never really saw in the original movies. So it's super cool to see that on screen. And you get this like crazy sense of how deadly a well-trained Jedi can be. So right off the bat, you're struck by his appearance. What a character designed for him. Incredibly intimidating, as every bit as intimidating as Darth Vader, but without the mask. You see that menacing human quality to him that's just fantastic there. Now, without dispute, the best dark side moment of this movie, and probably the prequels, is Darth freaking Maul. This guy's got tattoos, he's got horns on his head, and he has a double-sided red lightsaber. He beats the shit out of and kills Qui-Gon Jinn. And then on top of that, you have the just physicality and the skill, the unmistakable skill of Ray Park. That brought so much credibility to the threat of him that it matches the look of him. So that combination there of the look and the cred of just his skills such a great villain that really pops off the screen. Obviously, the Darth Maul battle is top notch. If we know that that lightsaber duel is like one of the like the great action packed fight scenes of the time, and I still think really holds up today. My favorite dark side moment, I, I guess it's also a light side moment, is the big climactic lightsaber fight between Darth Maul on the one hand and Obi Wan and Qui Gon Jinn on the other side with the Duel of the Fates track playing in the background that's been just, you know, remixed and memed everywhere. It was an amazing scene to watch in the theaters back then, and it is absolutely something that still stands up to this day. I have no idea what those blast doors are doing, <laughs> where they sort of seem to open and shut at random intervals. Like, I can't work out the logic of why you'd need something like that in the universe <laughs> you know hey let's have these eight doors in a row and let's have them sort of move left and right and turn around and occasionally just shut for a while but the little element inside of all that that i really loved is that whole red barrier part where you see the how these different characters face that pause in the action qui-gon is the warrior monk takes the time to lower his heart rate compose himself again you have darth maul the pacing predator the lion in the zoo that's just walking back and forth against the the glass and then you have the young and impulsive obi-wan who's just sitting there on his the balls of his feet ready to lash out and strike again i don't know why he didn't use his force to run faster through all that stuff but let's not dwell on the little plot holes no Unfortunately, Ewan McGregor has been cut off. Nobody one's just sitting there watching uh, Qui-Gon take on Darth Maul by himself, and he watches his master fall. Fall to the double-ended lightsaber of Darth Maul. And it enrages him. And they, he attacks even further, and it's just such a good scene. The fighting is great. The imagery around it is great, being in this like, huge mechanical beast of machinery moving around you, and all the big blue doors shutting back and forth. And again, he gets stuck. And the pair of them are just opposite each other. And while Darth Maul's pacing about, 
Obi-Wan looks into his inner Jedi training, sits on the floor, crosses his legs, and just waits for the moment. And then Darth Maul kills Qui-Gon. And it's so sad, because Qui-Gon Jinn is a great character in this movie. And, and now he's gone. And uh, Obi-Wan is left to get his revenge. And I think you can see that Lucas had no idea what he was creating there in the moment. Given that it was a one-off villain that they have now gone way out of their way in the universe to try and justify him coming back because he's just such a cool presence on the screen. And yeah, just that, that whole scene, I just love it to bits. It's just so well done. And that is probably, I, I'll probably say, apart from the Luke versus Darth Vader scene that we get in a couple of movies' time, that is probably one of the best fighting scenes in the entirety of the Star Wars series. Going into it, I knew, spoiler alert, Palpatine was the Emperor. And I knew that because I read the books. I knew there was a lot of terminology that came out of the books, like Coruscant came out of the uh, Expanded Universe, and Emperor's real name being Senator Palpatine, or maybe it was just Palpatine at the time. I knew that stuff. So going in when they introduced this character as Palpatine, I go, oh no, that guy's going to end up becoming the Emperor. But it's funny because most people didn't know that. Uh, At the very end of this movie, one of the cool setups that I really like that it does is the setup with, uh, uh, they're talking about the Sith Empire, and they're like, this definitely was a Sith that we fought, and uh, it's it's Yoda and Mace Windu are talking with Obi-Wan about how it's a Sith, and the Sith are back, and they say, but always two there are, a master and an apprentice, and they say, but which was destroyed, the master or the apprentice? And then the camera focuses in on Palpatine's face, and if if you've been reading the comics, I guess you knew this, because I think, I think the Emperor was named Emperor Palpatine in the comics previous to this movie coming out, but in the movies, that was a brand new thing. And, and it doesn't even tell you outright there that, that Palpatine is or will become the Emperor. But it's just this little tease. And that's the thing that I remember most of seeing this movie with my brother. Uh, is, is I remember my brother explaining to me that that was a filmmaking technique where the movie was telling you that that, that, that guy was the other Sith. And I did not get it at all as a little kid. But watching it now, it's just such a cool moment. Because all these movies existed before all of the, the the rumor mills and the gossip websites and all of that stuff and all the YouTube channels dedicated to nerd culture. This movie existed before all of that. Now, I'm sure by the second one they started to clue in. But in the movie, if you don't know that, if you're watching the movie as someone who's like, oh, it's a sci-fi movie, I'm going to watch this. There's really no clear indication that Senator Palpatine is the Phantom Menace. Which makes it so chilling to see him at Qui-Gon's funeral. And it's such a small moment. Looking back now, we go, oh yeah, he's going to become the Emperor and he does this stuff and he gets thrown off the building and possibly comes back to life in this new movie, we don't know, in The Rise of Skywalker. But in the context of the first movie, just the first movie in and of itself, you have a senator from Naboo who's trying to work with Queen Amidala who's trying to help in this blockade. A Jedi Master is killed on his home planet, and he's there to help memorialize this whole thing. And that is all you know. That is, he's there because it would be the same thing as if a war hero died in the state of Nebraska, senators from Nebraska would be there for his funeral. It is a standard thing. It's a very, very dark moment. Because we know why he's there. He's there because it's part of his master plan. I'm also not convinced that Jar Jar is not a dark Sith Lord who will come back in the newest movie. I really like the celebration music at the end of this. Um, Star Wars movies, uh, it's a common thing, right? For for it to end on a celebration. The original movie ends on a celebration with the award ceremony. Uh, not not episode five. Uh, Empire ends as as Kevin Smith so eloquently put it in Clerks, uh, it's a series of down endings. But then Jedi ends on a celebration, and this one ends on a great celebration too. And I really like the music that's playing on Naboo as they have the big parade celebrating their independence. Um, th- that's a really good scene as far as music goes. And I distinctly remember sitting there desperately wanting this to be good. And then afterwards, leaving the theater going, yeah, I... 
I I like that, right? I mean, that was good. I mean, it was Star Wars, right? It had to be good. And then you kind of realize, eh, maybe that wasn't such the greatest movie in the world. Now, as somebody in their mid-twenties now, looking back at The Phantom Menace, I can appreciate just how important this is to set up the mythology of 4, 5, and 6. Because as pure as the mythology was, especially in A New Hope, if you were to go back and tell the story of Anakin Skywalker and how he descended to the dark side and became Darth Vader, you really needed to set it up in a way that expanded the world and didn't keep it exactly the same. And I think George Lucas has been criticized unfairly for this. I've heard lots of accounts of people that went to see The Phantom Menace when it originally came out and thought it was a great movie, but then upon repeat viewings, realized how disappointing it was. But I think those people went in with unrealistic expectations. If you're setting up mythology, you need something that is a little bit more concerned with details that aren't necessarily as interesting as big fights and epic mythological moments. It does seem to kind of trip over itself having to like dump so much more exposition about the old prequel Star Wars universe by like bringing in uh, the planet of the Naboo and the Trade Federation and the Galactic Republic, never mind Jar Jar Binks and his underwater uh, civilization. And yeah, Jar Jar Binks is uh, a lot more annoying than he was 20 years ago. Yeah, I guess when you're 11 or 12, yeah, when you're 11 or 12, a lot of things are funnier than they are when you're older. I, like a lot of people, don't really like the idea of Metachlorians. It, I think the I think that the original trilogy did a lot better job uh, not really trying to explain the Force all that well. Um, I don't know. I The dialogue... I don't want to so much say that it was bad, it, that it was just mediocre. I think what happens a lot of the time with people that are creatively minded, that are trying to come up with their own story, is without outside people to help you hone your ideas and cut out unnecessary details and stuff, you'll end up with something that has too many things going on at once and not enough payoff. And I think that's what this movie suffers from. But the reason I think it suffers is because this is not a straightforward mythological movie like A New Hope, but it's also the first act in a new play that is being presented. And part of what The Phantom Menace did was it laid out a lot of groundwork for things that could be explored, but because of all the backlash that happened, George Lucas changed things in Attack of the Clones and arguably made a worse movie for it. But because he didn't have anybody actively working with him on the script or helping him hone his ideas, that made for a slightly jumbled movie and yes some of the ideas were better than the actual execution but it helped lay the groundwork for the overall universe in a way that is quite profound so obviously episode one gave us a lot of new stuff that as star wars fans was quite mind-blowing we got to see jedi in action in their prime which was amazing. We got to see pod racing. We got to see amazing set design, costume design. Music was different than what we had heard. And you had these really cool moments in The Phantom Menace that I think get lost because the story's not super tight and a lot of people had really high expectations. But if you were eight, and I know a lot of people who watched, as I've gotten older, I know a lot of people who watched the prequels as they were growing up, they, they loved them. As an adult, it was hard to look at some of the, like, what? Why are they making that decision? But when I remembered being a kid and watching Star Wars Empire Strikes Back Return of the Jedi, when I'm watching Phantom Menace for the first time, I would get those moments of, if I was eight, I couldn't wait to get home to play with my action figures to recreate this moment. While the movie does have successes, Darth Maul is an enormous success. The casting of Ewan McGregor is incredible. Ian McDermott, who plays the Emperor, or Palpatine in this, in this case, is great throughout. Um, 
I think that you can lobby legitimate criticism at the at the pacing and maybe the necessity of including so many dry things when it comes to it being a movie. I think it's fair to talk about some of the cast members here. And I think there are two clear standouts that were just amazing contributions to Star Wars. First, you have Ewan McGregor. And there are two things going into Star Wars that I was familiar with him from. First, maybe I shouldn't have, but I watched Train Spotting Young and knew him from that. And seeing him in that movie, I'm like, wow, this guy's pretty cool. This is a cornerstone awesome guy, and he's playing Obi Wan? That's neat. That's like a lot of like cool young movie nerd cred right there that I kind of liked in the movie. And I also knew him from an episode of ER, you know, NBC's much must see TV. It was one of those very special event episodes where you had to tune in because he was a guy, I think, robbing a convenience store and he got stuck in there with one of the cast members. And through the course of that episode, you start to find him very sympathetic and you start getting to his side. And I remember my brother being like, hey, I, I got to set aside time and watch this episode. And those two things alone propelled him to go into this iconic role and i found that very exciting and as when we get into it it turns out i think he and maybe one other character or one other actor truly got what this was they had a little bit of a wink they had a little bit of fun doing it and they didn't seem all that caught up by the clunky dialogue that they're often given and I thought he was just such an amazing, inspired person going into this and ca casting decision. And man, oh man, am I excited that he also clearly enjoyed this and wants to revisit it into this Obi-Wan TV show. That's really, really cool. And that's probably one of the biggest land lasting things because I'm going to will it to happen. Disney's not exactly dropping the ball of too much of their content. Sorry, Disney haters. But I kind of suspect that this Obi-Wan TV show is going to be good and probably better than The Phantom Menace. So that might be one of the biggest lasting effects from this is this casting moment right here. And then the other big one is Ian McDermott as Palpatine and eventually the Emperor. He, I think, is one of the few other ones that really got it and leaned into just like the bonkersness of the Emperor that we see eventually in Episode 3. So right off the bat, those are two great elements to the first movie here. And that's the thing. That... I don't enjoy watching the movie as much as I enjoy the fact that the movie exists. And let me explain what I mean by that. While the movie does have pacing issues, and look, I will just cut to the moment Obi-Wan comes out to fight like Darth Maul is one of the coolest things ever put to celluloid, or in this case, digital film. Um, I There are things to like, and, and there are things to criticize that I'm not going to get into now, um, but they're out there. Uh, why I like the reason that this movie exists is because suddenly Star Wars, which had been relatively small, big things happening, but you're in a in a small pocket of the big things. And that's kind of what makes the original trilogy so fun. But after this film, the Star Wars universe was huge. There was Coruscant. There was the Jedi Temple. There were the characters. There was Naboo. There was the Sith. There were all these things that, that, yes, had existed in the EU before, but were not codified visually for the moviegoer. And the fact that this is eventually going to explode into Clone Wars and into Rebels and into a series of books, which are incredible. If you get a chance to read Darth Sidious, um, the, the extended universe book, it's really good. Um, the fact that Star Wars became conceptually when you think about it as a fan if you want to sort of escape into the unreality of it you have so much more to think about now um and the 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 world that is provided for you as as 
someone who imagines and to other creatives who came in and expanded it, expanded, expanded it, is enormous. You went from just here are some rebels fighting an empire to here is the structure of the galaxy as we know it. The, while the game itself might not have been as fun as it once was, it's safe to say that the playground is infinitely bigger. Look, if you're not a big fan of the Star Wars prequels or this movie in particular, give it another shot. And this time when you watch it, instead of getting hung up on all the cringing that you're doing and all of the moments that are very hard to watch, try celebrating the things that are creative and innovative. See it as laying the foundation, as being a necessary step in that direction, if you can't appreciate it as something that is as good as the original trilogy. At least give it that much. But regardless of what you think of this movie, I love it. Yes, some of my appreciation for this movie is nostalgic in nature, but I think there's something in this movie that a lot of people overlook. Um, generally, uh, it's not one of my favourite Star Wars films, but it's still a very good film. It still holds up. And like I say, the action scenes in this film are very, very good. I do do love, especially that fight scene at the end. It's just so, so epic. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, where, where does it stand in the overall franchise of the universe? It's not one of the most loved. I'll give it that. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, you could probably say it has some flaws. But in all honesty... It is very, very much a Star Wars film. You can't say anything else about it. <laughs> George Lucas stuck to the formula. Whether it worked or not for the people in the audience is up to them. I still applaud it for for giving me not just more Star Wars. I mean, it was 1999. I'd waited forever for more Star Wars. And while I walked out going, having the, ah, oh, I don't know if that was that good, I did go back and see it a bunch of times because it's just more Star Wars. And what it gave me, and I talked about this a lot on our Trek Off podcast where I talk about uh, the way that the new Star Trek show Discovery is expanding the universe. Um, it's the space between that I enjoy that I can discuss and theorize and read about and watch eventually shows and other movies about what's happening in this space now that I have the world set up for me. It's like setting up toys and telling my imagination to go play. So for that, I'm excited about episode one, The Phantom Menace, uh, as it exists for film. And uh, I give it, uh, sure, yeah, I like it, guys. Sorry, I mean, I know that some people don't, but I like it. So uh, I hope the rest of you too, too. So, to summarize, I think it's safe to say that we all went in wanting this to be a great movie. And a great Star Wars movie, specifically. But I also think that most people, if they do an honest reflection on this movie, I think they'll recognize this is not a good movie. By any real standard, right? I don't think it's overly well written or well acted for the most part or well directed. And it's probably at least near the bottom of most credible Star Wars movie list rankings. But I think something interesting happened here. Because it's a Star Wars movie and one that hit at such a special moment of coming back after being away for so long, it developed into something different. Because it's a Star Wars movie starring Darth Vader and Obi-Wan, some of these crucial characters, it can't just slip away. Not like I think the Solo movie might at some point. It's a cultural cornerstone. It's always going to be a touchstone for so, so many people. Of all the prequels, I think this is the movie that my friends and I quote or reference the most of it. I do a fairly frequent... Jar Jar Binks steady at work and people go like oh ew they know what that is but they kind of laugh at it and yeah I know it's from a different movie but the character is from this my buddy does a dead on Watto impression Ani, that kind of thing that was embarrassing but he does it much better the I will do a spin that's a good trick nonsense and we talk about that, I, I can't believe how often we talk about that dumb Nemoidian with the mechanical mouth and eyes. I, what a clown that thing is, but everybody knows it. So when we talk about this movie, or quote it, we're making fun of it. But do we hate the movie? Absolutely not. We're joining together and enjoying a shared experience about this movie that we know inside and out. It's still on TNT constantly, and when it is... I'm watching it. 
So yeah, we all wanted a great movie out of this, but we got something different. We got a movie that thrives as an inside joke for nerds. This is, you know, it might be a little harsh, but this is The Room. Birdemic for my people, my age. But at the same time, I can show this to my son and he'll unironically love it. So my final thought for this really is when you look at the final equation, this is an entertaining movie, but for a handful of different reasons. But what's important is we're all kind of coming together and having fun with this. So, you know, in the end, that's not that bad, right? In case you can't tell, I really like the Star Wars prequels and I appreciate what they do for the overall mythology of the Star Wars universe. But I also recognize that this movie has heaps of cringeworthy moments. And there are many times while watching it that I'm either making fun of the dialogue, the delivery, the blocking of the actor, or something that's happening with the CGI. But this movie also has a lot of amazing stuff if you can just look past all the awkwardness. I know a lot of people have issues with the prequel trilogy and in particular episode one, but I for one love it and always will. Podcasters Assemble, probably, Season 2, The Rise of Podcasts, is a production of the We Can Make This Work, Probably, Podcast Network. This episode, edited and produced by Troidal Power. Find more of our shows at probablywork.com, and learn how to contribute to future episodes of Podcasters Assemble, Probably, by looking us up on Twitter at Casters Assemble. Submissions are always open. Thank you to everyone who was able to contribute to this episode. Be sure to check the show notes for links to places where you can find them all online. Podcasters Assembled Probably will return in Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones.